I'd like to uh, call this meeting of the uh, Capital Investment Committee to order for Wednesday, March 21st. Um, first thing we'll do is to approve the uh, minutes of March 20th, and uh, yeah. I think that uh, the day Representative Lilly has. Uh, so they Representative Lilly, would you care to move the minutes? Mr. Chair, I'd be happy to move the minutes of the that are before us. Thank you. Thank you. Those in favor, say aye. Aye. Opposed? Sorry. And we have approved minutes. Uh, we have uh, several uh, bills before us today, and uh, we'll just be, be getting uh, informational uh, hearings on each of these bills. Uh, we'll try to move right along. Uh, uh, brevity will place you higher on the uh, <laughs> approval scale. Um, Did you hear that, Lynn? Except for you, Representative Nelson, uh, Carlson, you as, as long as you want. Oh, that's a date, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Mr. Chairman, when you called on uh, Representative Lilly, you know, you and I were both social studies teachers, and when I had a student that wasn't paying attention, and, you know, of course he was wandering around, sometimes I would call on them to uh, say, uh, you know, Johnny, is this being recorded? what's your answer to that question? <laughs> <laughs> and that would bring them back into the group. Not that that would have been your motivation. Yeah. No, uh, certainly not. Uh, we have before us uh, House File uh, 2901, uh, Representative Carlson, uh, present your bill. Yeah, Mr. Chairman, and uh, I understand you want to be brief because there's a follow-up meeting. And uh, I've asked the uh, testifiers to uh, keep it within uh, the guideline of uh, 10 minutes, but I do have two testifiers. Is that 10 minutes each or total? Well, that'll be up to the chair. <laughs> um, I told them 10 minutes. We didn't divide it up uh, beyond that. No, I think um, that would be just great. Thank you. <laughs> okay. But Mr. Chairman, just very briefly, um, this is a request for uh, $2 million, the uh, pool in New Hope, and I want to thank you for coming out and doing a site visit. Um, is it currently the one that was removed, it was old, needed to be replaced, was a 50-meter pool? And it's really of um, significance for the whole northwest uh, suburban uh, area for the swim teams. They need a 50-meter pool. The city of New Hope uh, has the resources to do a 25-yard pool, and if they can get the additional two million, which is in the bill here, then they'll be able to do a 50-meter uh, pool and satisfy the needs of the uh, swim teams that come from several communities in the northwest uh, suburban area. And uh, with no um, further ado, if you will, I'd like to turn it over to the uh, city manager, Kurt McDonald. Uh, to make uh, comments from the city's perspective, if that's all right with you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, uh, Representative Carlson and uh, Mr. McDonald. Welcome to the committee. Uh, please introduce yourself and begin. Mr. Chairman and committee members, uh, my name is Kirk McDonald. I'm the New Hope City Manager. And with me today in the audience is our Mayor Kathy Humpkin and Susan Rader, our Director of Park and Rec, and Bob Kroonstedt, the Executive Director of Minnesota's Women. So thank you for the opportunity to speak to you briefly today. Uh, to talk about uh, our request to assist with funding for the construction of an outdoor 50-meter swimming pool. So we did provide an informational packet, and uh, you'll find information about our request in that. Today I want to just focus briefly on two key issues, uh, the regional use of the facility and the importance of a 50-meter pool. So uh, New Hope constructed a 50-meter pool back in 1965. The cost at that time was $250,000. It was approved by a voter referendum at that time. The pool is 52 years old, deteriorated in condition, leaking, mechanical systems failing. We're currently in the process of demolishing the existing pool or committed to building a new aquatics facility. So first, the regional use. Over the years, the 50-meter pool has been utilized on a daily basis <coughs> for local regional swim team practice from New Hope, Crystal, Plymouth, and Hopkins for competitive swim meets. The facility also provides Red Cross swim lessons for a diverse population of children from across the northwest suburban area, including Brooklyn Park, Brooklyn Center, Fridley, Golden Valley, Hopkins, Maple Grove, Minnetonka, Plymouth, Robbinsdale, and so on. In addition to open swimming, uh, there was also seasonal passes available, and we provided uh, uh, 
information about resident location that bought seasonal passes in your packet. The bottom line is it's been an important asset to the North Metro region. Now the city has budgeted eight and a half million dollars to construct a new outdoor swimming pool complex that includes a 25 yard pool, 25 yard pool. That includes decking, mechanical equipment, bathhouse, parking lot, and so on. <clears throat> the cost of a 25 yard pool is approximately $2 million and is included in the budget. But the swim teams have strongly encouraged the city to construct another 50 meter regional pool. The cost of that is about $4 million. So we're here today to request that the state consider making a similar investment into this important public project, funding the additional $2 million to expand the 25 yard pool to a 50 meter pool. <coughs> because the pool serves the entire region, we don't feel that the New Hope taxpayers should have to bear the total cost of the regional facility. The city is committed to paying for the ongoing operational costs in future years. <coughs> the second topic I want to hit on is just what's the difference between a 25 yard pool and a 50 meter pool? Well, the competitive uh, Swimming community told us loud and clear. Each summer teams from around the metro area look for an opportunity to train in a 50 meter pool and there's not many left in the area. Many teams travel out of state for competitive meets due to the lack of 50 meter pools. Uh, the Olympic swimming format is in 50 meters. It centers around long course pools. Building a 25 course pool eliminates the option of competing in Olympic format. <clears throat> and speaking of Olympics in the Northwest Metro area, we have had swimmers that have qualified for the Olympic trials, both in 2012 and 2016. Some even made the Olympic team. <clears throat> what they all have in common is uh, a love of swimming, dedication, perseverance, and access to train in a 50 meter pool. So a uh, 50 meter pool is a rare and critical element, and uh, that's why we're requesting your support. And now, Bob. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> City well, Manager McDonald. Introduce yourself, please. Yes, I will. Uh, my name is Bob Crumstead. I serve as the Executive Director of Minnesota Swimming. Uh, we are a nonprofit statewide organization uh, serving 10,000 competitive swimmers, their coaches, officials, and families. First, I want to praise the City of New Hope for their investment in this project and thank their leaders here today along with Representative Carlson for the opportunity to speak uh, in support of this bill for my membership. Our members are involved with 67 swim clubs located all over the state. Our member clubs are using pools for their 25 yard, 25 yard competitions wherever they can. The supply of those types of, of pools are pretty good. According to a 2015 study by Hanover Research for the Minnesota Department of Education, there were 224 pools in Minnesota public schools. However, the number of 50 meter pools for competitions today is just eight. 20 years ago, that number was 13, so there's been a 38% decrease in 50 meter pools in this area. Coupled with a 46% increase in membership over the same period, the math does not bode well for our kids who want the opportunity to participate in, in competitive swimming above the local level, just like their friends in other sports such as soccer and hockey. <coughs> to further illustrate demand for 50 meters, we have families driving through rush hour traffic in the Twin Cities from Forest Lake, Badness Heights, and Moundsview to attend a 50 meter work, workout in Richfield. We have families attending competitions in Iowa, Wisconsin, and now new 50 meter facilities in Sioux Falls, South Dakota, and West Fargo, North Dakota. When we conduct our own season ending competitions in the summer, all, 50, all the 50 meter pools we're using are in southern Minnesota. And if the U of M is available, it's the northernmost 50 meter co competition pool in the entire state, the U of M. The point, the location of a 50 meter competition pool in New Hope is, is very regionally significant. So why are 50 meter pools such a big deal to us as compared to 25 yards? This is the size for pools for regional, national, international competitions, including the Olympic trials and the Olympics. In the summer, it is the distance we use for our qualifying and state competitions. And simply put, this is the distance for thousands of youth swimmers who aspire to be their best in the sport. Our 50 meter competitions are an absolute sellout with, with the limited facilities we have right now. 
I believe New Hope has a tremendous opportunity to replace a competition pool built 52 years ago with programming, design, and technology that can make a new pool successful for local, local and state users for the next 50 years. I could say without reservations that members across from across the state will be enthusiastic about this investment by the City of New Hope and the state. Thank you for the opportunity to, to uh, speak on behalf again of, of this uh, for my membership. Be happy to answer any questions about competitive competitive swimming and in, uh, in Minnesota swimming if there are any. So, Mr. Chairman, that would uh, conclude our um, presentation. Uh, we're available for questions. I know that. Uh, you wanted us to be brief because of other bills that would be up. Um, by the way, I want to point out too uh, that in your packet there are letters from other municipalities, including the North Metro Mayors Association and so on, in support of the project. So uh, that's just another point about uh, its regional uh, importance and uh, significance uh, as far as competitive swimming is concerned. So thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Representative Carlson and uh, Mr. Crookstead. So then. Close enough. <laughs> um, so just so I, I have this straight, you, you said that there are um, eight 50 meter courses in or courses pools in Minnesota. Eight, uh, Chair, Chairman Earl, thank you. And the uh, eight 50 meter pools that we can use for competitions. Eight. And right. they're all in southern Minnesota. Winona, Rochester, Boston, Mankato. Um, and then the University of Minnesota, and I'm going to forget something. And, no. You named them all five. Of them. Yeah, I actually. <laughs> uh, well, Bloomington, I'm sorry, Bloomington and uh, Highland Park over in St. Paul. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, and the pool, of course, has general public use. Uh, how many um, more specialized use participants would there be? Uh, you're all, I'm sorry, the, the, in addition to the competitive swimmers? Yeah, uh, basically I'm talking about how, how many competitive swimmers oh, okay. would uh, be utilizing this? Yeah, I think in, any, um, in a long course pool or 50 meter pool uh, competition, uh, we could see four, five, or 600, depending upon you know, how many days or how many sessions we can have. Uh, in our, our state championship, uh, typically we'll have 1,400. Swimmers will conduct that either at the University of Minnesota or Rochester or some configuration of those those sites. Yeah, Representative Hausman. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I, um, I think I got clarity from your comment. I was reading all the letters in your packet, and one of them from the University of Minnesota, which seemed to suggest they didn't have a um, a pool to train in. They said it's very difficult to reach the NCAA Division One level without this opportunity. But you said they do, in fact, have one. Do they? Yes. Um, so they're just writing in support and not because they don't have access. Um, that's, that's correct. Yeah, yeah, that's correct. They're, they're, they have access, yes. Mr. Uh, Representative Detmer. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Mr. Chair. And uh, to the testifiers, is there a diving well also with this? There is, yes. Mr. McDonald? Okay. Uh, and uh, Mr. Mr. Chair, Representative uh, Detmer. Is, there, is there different levels for the diving well? Uh, all the plans really haven't been finalized, but currently we have two different style diving boards. That would, Mr. Chair, and just to follow it, to, to yes. meet the, the Olympic standards, is that where we're talking about? Mr. Would, would, it, would it meet the Olympic, Olympic standards for diving for the different events? Oh, uh, I'm not sure. Mr. Mr. Chair, Crook said. Yes, um, my understanding of the plans is there is a one meter board okay. and a three meter board plan. Um, you see those those level of diving in, in the Olympics. You don't you wouldn't have platform diving okay. from what I can okay. tell from okay. the Thank you. Drawings. Any other comments, questions? Representative Carlson, any final words? Well, that uh, concludes our uh, presentation, and I just want to uh, thank uh, you, Mr. Chairman, for your site visit as well as uh, giving us an opportunity to. Uh, do the presentation before the uh, full committee. So uh, thank you. Well, thank you. Next item is House File 1089, Representative Russell.
Oh, wait. Representative Russell. You Thank you, Mr. Chair and filled. committee members. Um, I'll be presenting House File 1089 relating to capital investment appropriating money for expansion of the Northwest Angle School in War Road, in the War Road School District, authorizing the sale and issuance of state bonds. Uh, I didn't bring any. I didn't bring any uh, uh, video or, or pictures or anything like that because the majority of you uh, were on the bonding tour, and the presentation that uh, that was made by the uh, teacher from the Inlet School and by the War Road Superintendent spoke uh, spoke so many words in every picture that they showed of the need that is there for the school. Uh, the school is in is in very rough shape. It is the northernmost one room school. Well, actually, it's the only one room school left in the state of Minnesota that's functioning, and it's the northernmost elementary school in the lower 48 states. So it has a lot of a lot of unique qualities, and it's got a lot of needs. The school uh, the school uh, serves grades K through six, approximately 13 children. And that, that fluctuates, and one of, the, one of the families, I think, has uh, eight of those children attending school. Uh, the school also serves uh, children from the, from the nations in the Canadian, province, as Canadian provinces as well. So it's a very unique spot and a very, a very much needed uh, elementary school for these children. The teacher of, uh, of 30, uh, she's been working there for 35 years, and that teacher has been a as far as I'm concerned, has been a godsend for them. Has been a real trooper about working with the children, working under the, the very adverse conditions uh, of, due to the condition of the school. She has one assistant, and you know, from what I understood from the War Road Superintendent, is that she doesn't have any plans of retiring anytime soon. That's because she she loves those kids and she loves that community, and she wants to keep uh, keep serving. But uh, from what I understood, the uh, superintendent said that uh, they do have two teachers waiting to take her place should she come to retire. So it's, a, it's, a, it's some place where, where we have backups ready to go and serve. Some of the problems there, as you saw from the pictures and from the presentation that they, that they made on the bonding tour, water leakage. Kids have to carry around buckets and move them from place to place. They have some of those buckets sitting on their desks to catch the water leaking in. They wear, in the winter time, they have to wear their winter jackets or wrap up in blankets so they can attend while they're attending school, working on their, working on their classroom uh, stuff. And at recess time, if it's too cold to go outside and you know where the, nor where the uh, inlet school is at, uh, it's 30, 40 below at times. And if it's too cold to go outside, they have to move their desks in a space probably as big as the area in between our, in between our uh, chairs here. They have to move their desks out of that and that's where they have recess. So it's not a whole lot of space for those kids to run around and to burn out some, burn out some extra steam. Representative Fabian and I went up there to tour the school and uh, it, it was quite, a, quite an experience. These kids, to see these kids uh, smiling, happy to be going to school, happy to be with each other, and the teacher uh, having so much dedication to take care of them, make sure that, that uh, they get the education that is needed. Um, it's, it spoke volumes to uh, how dedicated their, their families are and the, and the teacher. Um, it's, it, it was, it was kind of tough because uh, the teacher took me off to the side and said that uh, just before we got there, that somebody had pulled the tarps off the roof so that we wouldn't see the, the tarps that were trying to help keep the water out. And so I, 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 my first thought was, there's, just, there's, something, there's something wrong here with this, with this when, when the, uh, an elementary school, uh, uh, even as small as this one is, isn't being kept up like it should so that these kids can have a good environment to learn in. Some of the work has been done. The, uh, there were some questions about, about uh, where some of the funding was going that should have been going to the school. 
and I addressed those issues with the War Road uh, Superintendent. Yeah, he came. He had he had some solid answers. Uh, he's making. He's the interim superintendent. Uh, the superintendent that was there when I went up for the tour. The answer when asked. Uh, uh, the answer given when asked where the where the uh, money for the, the intended for the school was going. The answer that the parents got back was the previous superintendent didn't keep very good uh, count or very good books. So uh, myself, being an old cop, I'm going, is someone is someone being held accountable for this? And so I did some digging into that to, to try to get to the bottom of where is this funding going? And they're getting that straightened out. They're getting the school board uh, on board with making sure that funding goes where it is supposed to go and where it is needed. So they have put some money into the school. Um, I guess I should at, at this point uh, talk about uh, the amendment that's on this bill. I'd like to. I, I'd like to move. We don't have to. Okay. Well, that'll work too. But uh, don't throw it away. Sometime you may have to. I won't. <laughs> I won't throw it away. Uh, the community. The community has been uh, dipping into their own pockets and trying to make trying to make repairs as they could and trying to keep uh, keep things in order but there is need for there, there is need for some some serious repairs and expansion so the school is asking the school's asking for approximately the school is asking for the $509,000 to to finish the project and to uh, give the kids a, an area to where a small gymnasium to where they can stretch their legs and where they can where they don't have to move their desks for playtime and uh, to pass the roof pass the roof make make it uh, make it a serviceable serviceable building they've got a new furnace now so they don't have to wrap up in blankets all the time during the winter <clears throat> and uh, so they, they've been the community has been trying to help out as much as they can with what they can. But my ask is, like I said, is for $509,000 of, of bonding funds to help, uh, to help make this an environment that is, uh, that is uh, good for these children to be learning in. Uh, Representative Russell, a few <coughs> questions. Is this for renovation and expansion or just expansion? Uh, for, for, I believe it's for renovation and expansion. It's it's to uh, to try to repair uh, some of the some of the uh, some of the shortcomings in the original building, and then to expand that building uh, to make a a larger uh, a larger play area for the kids for cold weather. And part of it is to uh, part of where they're expanding to. There's an old uh, uh, house. There's an old teach teacherage where the uh, the uh, school teacher used to live while serving up there, but that has become in such a state of decay that it just needs to be removed so that they can they can uh, expand. Uh, thank you. Uh, Reverend Grassel, since we were there, or not there, but had the presentation given us, um, have they made any improvements? I mean, like, does she still have to carry the chamber pot out each day? And no, not at this time. There was some there was some uh, work that was done, and there was uh, some work that wasn't really done to uh, to par. And those are I I told the uh, the War Road School Superintendent that that needs to be addressed, and make sure that you know that that is for them to 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 get straightened out. But I I, I told them that needs to be addressed. Make sure that stuff is done right. Uh, and also, Representative Grossel, um they uh, trying to think what other things. That, oh, what would you describe what a child has to do uh, if they were to go to War Road to school from there? Okay, I'd be I'd be glad to to explain that. The reason the reason this, this little uh, school is so important. Is that it is approximately uh, it's approximately 65 to 70 miles of of uh, travel. You have they'd have to go through four border crossings, two going down to War Road, two coming back to uh, the inlet. So you have these elementary children who are who are in the summertime 
boating in from islands and uh, getting to the school in, in the probably just more than likely just getting day late or still dark. And then they'd have to get on a bus and travel for uh, 65 to 70 miles to the War Road Elementary School where they would go. And if you've ever been up in Manitoba or in the Ontario provinces, there's some pretty pretty desolate area. There's It's it's not uh, greatly inhabited. Well, if, Mr. Eklund, you, you live up in the falls, so you know you know what uh, what the areas are like up further north. So it's it's a, a very rugged environment, and frankly, I wouldn't want my kids having to ride a school bus, go through four border crossings a day, to just to go to school in War Road. How, this, how long would it take to get there? It would probably take about an hour and a half, I would say, from from the inlet to the to the uh, War Road's uh, elementary schools. Okay, the concern there is you're you're putting you know, very young children yes. uh, on a bus for three hours a day. If, I mean, for those who are thinking they should send them to War Road right now and forget the school. I mean, that's what they'd have to be doing. And, and, and again, Mr. Chair, they are also serving several children from the nation's city, the, the uh, I, I believe it's Ontario uh, is a province that would, would be affected there uh, from the nations that come to that, that also come from the islands to that uh, the school at the inlet. Now, my Representative Grouse, my uh, understanding is that the War Road School District, no, not War Road, the, the county I mean, I think that the uh, school is in, that the inlet <laughs> school is in. What, what, Lake of the Woods County. Lake of the Woods County uh, does, is supposed to be contributing yes. $300,000 each, each year. Um, so the question does, of course, become uh, and, and I understand you're digging into it, but where, where's that money going? Exactly, and that's what, those are the questions I've been asking the, the superintendent, and, and uh, he's getting on the same, uh, get on the right sheet of music with the school board, and to make sure that, uh, figuring out where this money is supposed to be going, and, and, and where, it, where, it has, where it has been going, and to correct it, and get it going back to the, back to the uh, inlet school. Uh, Certainly, Representative Grossel, it's a, a sad situation in there. I think there are a few of you that uh, were not able to uh, to make up there to see this, but uh, it's a very sad situation. I know that, uh, for example, Representative Gunther would have brought tears to his eyes had he been there. Uh, Representative Hausman. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so we don't usually do elementary schools, and um, but the K-12 committee has written some exceptions into law, but they're very specific. Have we, uh, I, I don't know if this bill has gone to K-12, whether they've, have they measured it against that um, language in law to determine whether whether this school fits the criteria that they make exceptions for? I would think normally that decision would be made by the K-12 committee. Uh, thank you, Representative Hausman. My understanding is that it is currently uh, with the uh, uh, K-12 Finance Committee. And I, I will say you are right that you know normally we don't do bonding for things like this, but there are uh, exceptions where uh, the state has provided bonding for uh, for secondary schools and and, and for uh, primary schools. Uh, so uh, and and I will say that last spring, uh, just as this bill last spring was being uh, finalized, I received a call from. Uh, Commissioner Casilius in the Department of Education asking that I uh, you know, help out with this. And Mr. Chair, Representative Loon is consulted too at some point then. Yes. <laughs> Representative Ugla. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Representative Grossel, I, yeah, I, I saw the presentation when, when we were up there and, and uh, it's a very unique situation and a very difficult situation for those poor kids. And, mm -hmm. and I agree we have to do, do something. And if we can be innovative in our financing for this very good cause, I think that would be the proper way to go. Uh, my question is, and, and you know, it's been kind of an ongoing discussion, but we've never really uh, got to the bottom of it, is, is this $300,000? And you know it is this, it is the local school district, and from speaking for myself, I'm more than willing to help out. But is this um, funding request of five hundred nine thousand dollars? Is that for the total project? Then uh, there's no local 
match or school district uh, or county money going in? They Mr. put, it, it was 700, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, it was $700,000 and they put the, uh, uh, however however much that was, 100,000, what do they say? Yeah, it was approximately uh, $102,000 that they put into it to bring it up to, uh, to make some repairs to get things started. So that came, apparently that came from uh, the school district to to start, to, to start, uh, Make and write what what has been left to decay there, Mr. Chair. So then, uh, Representative Grasso. So, so the original one-room schoolhouse is going to uh, in the new project is going to stand, and then it's essentially an addition we're talking about for the rest of the money. Is that correct? To make the repairs, to finish making the repairs. Thank you, Mr. Chair. To, to finish making the repairs and to. Expand into the uh, with the the small gymnasium area. Right. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Rivers of Sock. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And to the point that you were raising earlier, I'm still troubled uh, by two parts of this. Neither one of them having any bearing on whether I want to fund this. Mm -hmm. Both of them having to do with the credibility of the function of what we saw. So one is, has authority and management been established? You're, you're our only eyes and evidence right now, and so I'm asking you just that you would give whatever impression you're left with as to understanding that there is an active, functioning management and structure there. The, the second part of it being, I'm still quite troubled that there was a substantial financial responsibility to somebody here, the county or the, the school district tax base, something, and that nobody seems to be too excited, other than I expect you have been, nobody seems to be too excited about accounting for that money mm -hmm. and or if it is, if they've even been trying to do it. I mean, I, I, I will give them all kinds of deference if they can show me something personally. And this is about me personally. I understand you all will make your own judgments on this, but I am very troubled by that amount of money, which to these kids would have been the difference between day and night as to their education. I know how much money it takes to run a small building and you know 13 kids, and that was enough money but it certainly wasn't getting to them in terms of services. So I don't know if you've got some form of answer for those two areas. Representative Grossel. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Representative Sock. Uh, to answer the question of, of uh, where's the money going from uh, Representative Uglum and yourself, uh, the current, Mr. Uh, Mr. Hapla, the current superintendent, is digging into where, are, where have the funds been going and making sure that uh, if there is, if if the money has been going to the wrong places, get it corrected. So he's been taken. He's been taken uh, on that responsibility to try to make sure if the ship has been going in the wrong direction, get it corrected, get it righted. So as far as anybody being held accountable, I don't know at this point, but I'll, I'll find that out. I'll I'll do some more digging. I'll do some more asking. And uh, this is what was the what was the last one? Mr. Chair, the one was about acting like he, there is authority, yeah. a management authority in this structure of running a school district, and the second one was accounting for the dollars and where the where and if they've been okay. flowing and for again, the purpose. Mr. Thank you, Mr. Russell. And again, the, the uh, uh, Mr. Hapla has been uh, taken taken responsibility for for everything from this po from his point of uh, employment forward, and. Again, I'm gonna keep asking and checking to see, okay, where has this money been going? And if it is the $300,000, why hasn't it been going here? So those those questions haven't been answered to me yet either. Um, Hap, Mr. Hapla did say that uh, it, it was uh, around $100,000 rather than the 300,000 that was, that was uh, uh, spoken about by the parents. So to find out, okay, what's the, what's the correct number and to, then get it pointed in the right direction. Now, I'm going to keep moving on that to keep heading heading to where it needs to be. And if there is 
any foul wind of of someone that uh, needs to be uh, held accountable. I'll make sure and, and either have them contact the proper authorities or I'll do it myself. Thank you, Representative Sock. Yeah, just one, I was gonna get to that point. It isn't in your or my job classification or our um, work portfolio mm -hmm. to audit schools and to do a functioning audit in terms of how, how they're working. And I don't know if it's if there's need here for the uh, an appropriate authority to start becoming more aware of what's going on. I, I know that you're more than capable of it, but I'm I am not I am not going to want to assume that you should be. And I, I don't know the chair could tell me to go crawl in my box and go away. But um, I'm just offering that I think that there's cause that there should be more than the local representative trying to sort this out. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I will take two more questions and we gotta move on. First okay. of all. Thank Rep you, Mr. Chair. I was just gonna answer that quick. Oh. Um, Representative Sock, um, that's an excellent idea. And if we could talk, if we could talk more about it, then you know, that, that would give me uh, some, uh, maybe some proper direction in which to send this. Thank you. Uh, Representative Considine. Representative Lewick will then move on. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, uh, yeah, I went to a one-room school from 1955 to 1960. I will admit we had outdoor bathrooms, uh, but I'm not kidding you. That school was in a whole lot better shape than what the pictures we saw uh, up there uh, this past summer. So I'm not. I, I'm concerned, but. That's, a, that's another avenue to figure out which superintendents ought to have their hair rubbed off their head and which school boards need a swift kick in the rear and which county auditors did probably not send the right money uh, to the right place on this. But in the meantime, we got first through sixth graders uh, that need a decent place to go to school. So that's a pretty, thing, pretty easy thing for me to answer and that is we can get that fixed or at least headed in the right direction in one construction season. We can investigate and hold people accountable for the next five years. So I would suggest that uh, we attack the first thing first and that is to make sure those kids uh, get some help up there. Thank you, Representative Lewick. Uh, I think we'll go to final thoughts now. Okay. Well, I just, uh, everybody has seen the pictures, everybody's, uh, uh, been pretty well familiarized with the conditions that these children are having to attend school. And the size of the school, I think would, you know, just thinking about the, the 50 meter pool, I, I think the size of the school would probably fit inside of that 50 meter pool. So with that being said, I hope for your support on this. Thank you. <clears throat> Next up, oh, this would be a good one. Uh, House file 3475, Representative Detmer. Thank you, Mr. Chair. This will be a good one. Well, Representative Detmer, you may begin. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chair. And House File 3475, committee members, uh, provides uh, 3.3 million in bond uh, proceeds to the Commissioner of Natural Resources to grant to the City of Stillwater for pre-design, design, engineering, and construction. It's a total package. And restoration of the St. Croix River Bank in Stillwater and design a, and construct an integrated walkway along the, along the river bank. I've been able to walk this area. Uh, I went through the tour when, uh, along with the Senate, was actually there too. And um, I got to see uh, what this project needs to be done, what needs to be done along the river bank. I know the sewer line runs along that bank and there's been erosion. As you know, the uh, St. Croix River is a, um, is a scenic riverway and uh, we need to take care of that river. And the sewer line is exposed in certain areas along the, the walkway. And uh, also, uh, Stillwater is the birthplace. They say it's the birthplace of Minnesota. And we got two gentlemen here that uh, will also describe what the project entails. And 
Uh, with that, uh, I have uh, Mr. Tom Wiedner, and uh, he's uh, on the City Council for Stillwater. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Welcome. Introduce yourself, please. And Tom Widener uh, with the Stillwater City Council. <laughs> I'm Sean Sanders, the City Engineer. Okay, continue your presentation. Thank you, Mr. Chair uh, and committee members. The, the project here is really a public safety project to protect the 60-year-old infrastructure of a sewer that was, was built um, in close proximity and now in closer proximity to the river. What uh, the main issue here is the erosion of the riverbank. Uh, the, the sewer was built approximately 60 years ago. Uh, the riverbank, given the new weather patterns that we have with more frequent high water uh, problems, otherwise known as flooding, uh, which are more frequent, have, have eroded the, the riverbank uh, considerably in most places up to at least 20 feet. Um, given that, if you look in the last page of the handout that you have, the last page in the last picture, you see the exposed sewer pipe or sewer system, uh, which handles all of Stillwater's sewage on the way down to uh, its collection site in Oak Park Heights. Uh, this is in fact a local project, we recognize that. It has impact in Washington County and it has regional impact as well. It's a 4,400 foot project of which two thirds of which will be basically under construction to some degree. Um, closer to the downtown area, there is a project that is, will, will be pilings that'll help stabilize the riverbank which has again eroded away. Unfortunately in that spot, uh, it has eroded away the new DNR trail, MnDOT DNR trail that was just recently built. Um, so it, we have a congestion problem, a public safety problem, and the erosion problem from the uh, walkway and bike path that was just recently built uh, in conjunction with the new St. Croix River crossing that we'd like to protect as well. Um, we as a city council, <clears throat> recognize that as a local project, it's our responsibility for contribution that we approved last night matching funds to uh, what would hopefully be a decision by this board. Um, as, as indicated by Representative Detmer, this is a wild and scenic river. It is, it's a regional resource that we would like to protect. Uh, we would also like to protect the, uh, the general public using the bike paths and walkways that were just recently built that are currently being threatened by the erosion. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Uh, well, Mr. Chair, I, I, I'm more here for technical uh, questions that the committee might have. Um, so I, I think Mr. Widener um, proposed the project and we're ready for any questions if you have any. Thank you, Mr. Sanders. So, uh, have we questions, comments? Representative Dean. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair, and I might have just missed this, but so it's a $3.3 million ask. What is the total cost of the project? Is this encompassing all of the project or is there some other things that you're all currently still gonna be involved in? Because I know it goes all the way from design to final construction. Mr. Widener. Thank you, Mr. Chair and Representative Dean. It's a $3.3 million project in total. And it, that, that's all inclusive package. Any other questions, comments? Well, apparently a very good job, Representative Detmer. You can, you can Mr. finish Chair, it up. do I get extra points for that? So. <laughs> I'm sure. We'll Thank you, Mr. Them. Chair and committee members. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And now we'll move to the uh, last two items on the agenda, which are bills concerning the city of Minneapolis. Uh, first of all, House File 2898, Representative Dean.
Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you to the committee for giving us this opportunity to talk about a project in Minneapolis. Uh, it's the Upper St. Anthony Locks Redevelopment, uh, House File 2898. Uh, we're asking for $1.5 million to do some pre-development, pre-design, yeah. and work for, for this particular project. Uh, I have incredible individuals from the city of Minneapolis here in representation. And I just want to let you know that you're looking at the project here. Uh, it's not designed yet. I mean, it's schematic designs are in place. And with a project like this, that's going to, the design costs are going to be close to uh, $5 million. Sometimes raising the money, you need to do a little work up front to actually make that happen. So I'm going to turn uh, the, presentation and discussion of the project over to uh, Mayor Jacob Fry and then he'll move on to our other testifiers. Welcome Mayor Fry. Mr. Chair, thank you for having us, members of the committee, Representative Dean, thank you for kicking it off. This is for uh, to the Friends of the Lock and Dam Project, which deals with the lock uh, that was closed back in 2014 due to the spread of invasive species and carp. Uh, and right now the federal government is looking at decommissioning this particular site. So right now, more than ever, we've got this unique opportunity to repurpose this space, a space which presently has about two million plus visitors going through it on an annual basis. Uh, we probably won't have this kind of opportunity uh, again for quite some time where the space is being shut down and we have the, the opportunity to to, to sort of re-envision what it could ultimately be. This is a, a visitor, an interpretive center that is, is almost cantilevered over the lock. Um, and it overlooks, of course, the St. Anthony Falls, which is the birthplace of our, our city in, in Minneapolis. Uh, and there's, there's been quite a work that's been done uh, up to this point, but as Representative Dean correctly pointed out, this is just looking for $1.5 million for some of the pre-design work that will get us started uh, and off. Um, and so, yes, this is really a one-of-a-kind destination for, for Minnesotans and, and visitors to experience the, the history of uh, the Mississippi River. Uh, and I will now uh, turn it over to uh, one of the, the, the head planners on the uh, project, uh, Chirsty Munson, Munson to, to give a little bit more of a rundown. Thank you, Mayor. Welcome, uh, Ms. Munson. Please identify yourself for the record. My name is Chirsty Munson. I'm here representing Friends of the Lock and Dam. Thank you, Chair, Representatives. Uh, I want to also thank the mayor for his vision and leadership actually for some time on this project. It is an incredible opportunity uh, and I want to thank Representative Dean for bringing this forward uh, to the state. I think both of these leaders have studied this and understand that the falls will deliver significant benefits to the state. It's, it's more than a Minneapolis project and the handout that you have shows uh, the location of the project on the Great River Road. Uh, this is one of um, uh, Minnesota's top tourist attractions. The Falls is a coalition project, and you'll also note a number of logos at the bottom of the handout, which show the organizations, each of which has their own constituency, who have lent support and supported this project uh, really from the beginning. There are neighborhood groups, heritage groups, parks groups, uh, Minneapolis Water Taxi, uh, the University of Minnesota, it's a very broad constituency uh, supporting the project. The project assures iconic status for the largest lock on the Mississippi River at 49 feet tall. Uh, it's a work of civil engineering that stands nearly five stories tall and is dubbed a jewel. I don't know if anyone saw the Washington Post article last week, uh, but the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers veteran lockmaster Mike DeRusha uh, rightly calls it a jewel of the Mississippi. Uh, the program that we're uh, envisioning here focuses on public benefits, education and enrichment, and recreation. Uh, so there will be an exhibition and event center. There will be a visitor center. There's going to be significant uh, number of programming opportunities for recreation and, of course, uh, an educational component. The facility will be self-sustaining and will not require ongoing subsidy. The time is now for this project because, as the mayor uh, indicated, the Corps of Engineers is now undertaking a disposition study, not only for this lock, but all three locks serving the upper river as a result of the suspension of navigation at the upper lock. 
Uh, and as you know, the Upper Harbor Terminal, which uh, will be coming up next, uh, which was really the, the furthest north barge terminal on the Mississippi, is also a redevelopment site at this point. And these two sites are going to have a very unique opportunity to continue their relationship in the future, not through commercial navigation, but through uh, activation of the river and public benefit. Uh, we have an opportunity now as well to work with our congressional delegation to provide guidance to the Corps in this year's Water Resources Development Act. Uh, this also encourages action now because if, as the city has committed support, if the state also commits support, this puts us in a very good position to express the readiness of this project to move forward and to secure the support of our congressional delegates uh, in Congress in this session. That could save us about five years and a significant amount of money in implementing this project. We're seeking $1.5 million in pre-design uh, matched by $3 million from Friends of the Lock and Dam with the assumption that the private money will be spent first. And as Representative Dean indicated, uh, these images are conceptual. There's a lot that we need to work out in order to implement a project like this on a site this complex. Uh, so we, we really need your support. Uh, I want to thank you for your consideration and, and pass the mic now to Ambassador Kaplan to speak for the project. Good afternoon. Welcome, Mr. Kaplan. My name is Sam Kaplan. I'm the attorney for Friends of Lock and Dam. And when I was in Morocco, I became uh, understanding better of how America works, and that is that unlike most countries of the world, we have private philanthropy here that drives many of our public projects. And that's essentially what has happened here. A man by the name of Paul Riles has committed $5 million of his own funds to contribute to the development of this project that we're talking about. And it should be understood that from the beginning to the end of this project, there is never any element of for-profit motive except to the extent that the project itself will earn profit for the public benefit. Uh, Representative Dean has been wonderful in providing leadership on this. I'm proud to say he's my legislator, so I've got the right one. Uh, well, I would tell you, <laughs> <laughs> and, the may and I, I would also point out to you that the mayor formally was the third ward uh, council person in Minneapolis where this particular lo uh, is located, this project. So again, what I want to emphasize is that this is a real public and private partnership where the private part of it is coming in in the form of charitable mm -hmm. contributions. I think it's very important to recognize that we're sympathetic to the fact that you have limited resources and you have all of the issues we heard so far tonight, which are largely to take care of projects already in existence. And we understand the challenge of taking on a new project altogether. That's why I want to emphasize the million and a half goes for design only after we put in three million private dollars contributed to the process. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Uh, questions or comments? Well, Ambassador Kaplan, your fine representative has done such a good job that we just don't have any comments on it. Uh, well, Representative Dean, would you? Yes, I, I'd like to conclude. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and of course, thank you, committee members. I want to personally thank uh, Mayor Jacob Fry, Chersey Munson, who's leading this project, and of course, Ambassador Kaplan for coming by today. This is a significant project, and it's significant for the region, but it's also significant for the state. If we think about the number of people that actually visit Minneapolis in a year, and actually come to this part of the city, uh, let's not forget that there's this little tiny stadium you know, maybe five blocks away that, uh, you know, tens of thousands of people come to every Sunday for Vikings football, but that's also used year-round for other types of events. So this is the type of uh, project that would be a huge asset uh, to the state of Minnesota and for the people that, uh, that come and visit Minneapolis. Uh, we may not have been the first city 
but I'd like to think that we're a pretty significant city for the state of Minnesota. So thank you all. Thank you. And now, Representative Lee. Part two of our Minneapolis presentation. So, Mr. Chair, uh, I did mention Lee. that I have a vacant top donut for you, but unfortunately, one of my constituents came by and took it, so I do have an Oreo top donut for you if you want. <laughs> well, I had uh, 15 million for you now, maybe. <laughs> this is going great. <laughs> it, it's all right, Representative. Oh, ooh. Mr. Chair? Yeah, uh, Mr. Thing. Chair? There are very important things happening over here. May I say something to uh, uh, my, my uh, colleague, yes. freshman? Yes. Representative Grossel. Representative uh, Lee? Excuse me, Representative Lee. Yes. <laughs> you gave, you, you brought, you, you brought uh, snacks, the first bill you presented? Don't let them fleece you anymore for any more snacks. <laughs> you only have to do it one time for one committee. Sounds good. So, just to no, no, just every committee. No, don't <laughs> don't let them don't let them keep hazing you. You're right. I'll do. Uh, are you ready to go, Representative Lee? I am. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So uh, the treats I just want to mention it's from and one of my. You. Thank you very much. By thank you, Mr. Chair. So the treats are yeah. from a nationally renowned uh, uh, pastry chef called Megan Bignell, and they just opened in my district two weeks ago, and so just wanted to uh, bring it by for the committee. And uh, Mr. Chair, remember- and It's I'm already or, always good to serve the constituent <laughs> instead of the committee chair. Yes, Mr. Chair. Uh, I'm asking for your support for House File 3161 for $15 million for public improvements for uh, site preparation to redevelop the Upper Harbor Terminal. Uh, this is the joint number one bonding request for the city of Minneapolis and for the park board. Uh, the upper harbor terminal is 40 acres, about one mile of riverfront of city-owned land along the riverfront in North Minneapolis that will uh, become private mixed-use development and public parklands. Uh, the new development will bring public investments, housing, and commercial investment to an area that has long been underserved in these areas. Uh, for generations, my district and residents have had limited access to the Mississippi River because of industrial uses that were crowning the riverfront. Uh, the Upper Harbor Terminal was used as a barging port on the Mississippi since the 1960s. Uh, when Congress closed the Upper St. Anthony Falls Lock to river traffic in 2014, the Upper Harbor was rendered inoperable as a port. So this closure created a once in a generation opportunity for transformational change to the Mississippi Riverfront in North Minneapolis. And uh, with that, Mr. Chair, I'd like to turn it over to Mayor Jacob Fry and uh, Mr. David Frank from the city of Minneapolis. Mayor Fry, and, and by the way, in your running career, did you eat a lot of this stuff? Oh yes, without a doubt. Is that what you fed your uh, cross country athletes as well? Three state championships later? <laughs> Mmm, <laughs> you're doing better and better. Yeah. I know. Uh, Mr. Chair, members of the committee, Representative Lee, thank you so much again for, for having us. This is the number one uh, priority in terms of bonding for both the city of Minneapolis and the Minneapolis Park Board. This is a 48 acre area, it's one mile on the Mississippi River in North Minneapolis, an area that has traditionally and continues to be cut off from the river by uh, quite a bit of heavy industrial, uh, followed by a significant highway in 94, and this is to bridge that gap. Uh, this is a, a partnership uh, between, this. I mean, this is a, a true public-private partnership here in, in terms of, uh, it's the city of Minneapolis, it's the Minneapolis Park Board, it is Thor Construction, uh, United Properties, and First Avenue, the music venue. Uh, this is an opportunity to have not just residential, but residential, commercial, retail, park space, green space, uh, and uh, uh, an amphitheater. Uh, and this is our this is our number one priority because it's a it's a neighborhood, it's an area 
of our city, whereas every other area has access to either lakes or riverfront, North Minneapolis does not. Uh, and we're trying to right that wrong right now. Um, again, the, the ask is for, for $15 million, and this is $15 million that will go directly towards getting this project off and underway. We already have site control. We already have the private investors set up. Uh, and this is just to, to make sure, this is just kind of the kind of bread and butter ask uh, to make sure that we could can uh, let this project ultimately see fruition. Um, so again, this is our this is our number one priority uh, from the city of Minneapolis, uh, and I'm going to turn it over to our uh, director of community planning and economic development uh, in David Frank. But first, I do want to give a, a huge thank you to Representative Fuli, who's been a wonderful champion, as well as Representative Raymond Dean, who's been a, a, a champion of this as well. Mr. Mayor, I think. The I apologize. Uh, before uh, before Director uh, Frank, uh, our commissioner from the Park Board, uh, uh, Chris Meyer. Thank you. Uh, I'm Chris Meyer. I'm one of the commissioners on the Minneapolis Park Board, and I'm the chair of our legislative and intergovernmental committee. And this is our number one priority as well because it's a tremendous opportunity for the state. It's part of our long-term master plan uh, to connect the full length of the river with parkland so that people can walk, run, and bike along the full length. And this is an area uh, that has been historically underinvested in, especially after uh, Interstate 94 went through the area, really re amputated that neighborhood from the river, and this is a chance uh, to reconnect that. And it's also a huge investment opportunity. Uh, when uh, the state helped invest in the Mill Ruins Park uh, next to the Stone Arch Bridge and the Guthrie Theater, uh, there were more than uh, $3 billion invested by private interests after that investment. Uh, the Stone Arch Bridge used to be fenced off, covered in weeds. Uh, now it's one of the biggest attractions in the entire state. And we can expect to see the same thing happen in North Minneapolis if you make this investment. And I'm sure uh, no matter where in Minnesota you're from, you'll have lots of constituents who are doing things like, like marathons, like our mayor does, <laughs> and uh, other activities along the river. Uh, so it's the number one priority for the park board, number one priority for the city of Minneapolis. We hope you'll make it a priority as well. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Frank. Chair, thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Representative Lee, Mayor Fry, and Commissioner Meyer. Uh, my name is David Frank. I'm the Director of the Community Planning and Economic Development Department for the City of Minneapolis. And you know you have the right author when there are donuts and other treats passed around. Mm -hmm. And everyone can help us by paging through the images that you have handed out, because I think we're having technical di difficulties on the images. So we will just walk you through, uh, I will just walk you through some of the details on the project, recap our ask, and then we are of course here for questions along with our fantastic development team. Uh, as the mayor talked about, as the commissioner talked about, as the representative talked about, the idea here is to create a vibrant new community on a one mile of riverfront, this 48 acre site, and to transform a former industrial property into something, into a project that has riverfront parkland, inland development, housing, and a world class entertainment space. It's the 48 acres you've heard about. And the idea is to connect North Minneapolis, the one part of the city which has not enjoyed the same connection to the waterfront as the rest of the city, to its riverfront. By bridging over uh, at Dowling to the riverfront, uh, working to create that connection to, which allows for, of course, access for the project and also access for the current residents and businesses of North Minneapolis to access that riverfront. The site needs really basic public infrastructure. So the ask that we are describing for you today, as the mayor said, is $15 million, which pays for things like site clearance for the park and for street areas, street network and access, park improvements, utilities and stormwater treatment, and pre-design for future amenities, like bike and pedestrian enhancements. And I should point out that this, this ask we are making would of course be matched with public resources from the city and the park board. And we believe would bring about between 100 and $150 million of private investment to follow. The city and the park board together put out a request for qualifications and selected the development team the mayor described briefly. United Properties, uh, Brandon Champeau is here, Thor Development, and D'Angelo Svenkison is here, and First Avenue 
And many of you may know they operate First Avenue in Minneapolis, as well as the Turf Club, I think, and the Palace Theater in St. Paul. We selected that team uh, along with the uh, urban designers of Cohen and Partners, and they have produced many of the graphics that you see in front of you. And we've gotten some great um, compliments from some of you on the work, and we think it's great so far. What you're seeing today is a sneak preview. Okay, we have done a lot of listening, a lot of engagement with the community, and we are about to go out to the community to get their input on some of the images that you are seeing here. We intend for this to be not only for additional new people who are moving here and new businesses to operate, but for the existing residents of North and Northeast Minneapolis to access the riverfront and to take advantage of these improved connections that we're seeking your support to help pay for. Equity is a thing that you hear about a lot, and that I should say specifically that what, that's what we are focused on. I mentioned before, there's a graphic in your packet, the one part of Minneapolis where residents and businesses don't have access to the waterfront is in this location. And so we are being very intentional when we, the city, and the park board say that this is our number one priority, that's why. It's about providing that access to communities who have not enjoyed that access in the past. Also, as we replace those in existing industrial uses with the new housing, with new commercial and new riverfront destinations, there will be those jobs, amenities, and housing opportunities for those same communities we are engaging with, we have engaged with, and will continue to engage with to make sure that the development meets their needs. So not just about the design, but about the rest of the project as well. There are three phases that you'll see. Uh, as you follow along, we're on slide seven, if you were trying to keep up. Um, the redevelopment plan, the draft plan that we formulated with the team has three phases. You can see phase one at the north end of the site, which I'll talk just a little bit more about in a minute. Phase two with mixed use on two inland parcels at Washington and Dowling. And then some flexibility in the future for phase three so we can see how the market responds. We're not trying to figure it all right out, out right now. We're trying to see how the market performs so we can decide what comes later. That first phase, let me talk about that. That will kick off the transformation of the site. The centerpiece is a new, slide eight by the way, a new community performing arts center that along with related commercial uses will make the site a cultural destination and give people a reason to go there, right? If you're trying to make a place, you need a place that people want to go and we believe that this use is that. Phase one will also include initial park improvements along the waterfront, a new plaza where Dowling is extended to the river, and a significant public park area south of the Performing Arts Center. North of the Performing Arts Center, a significant mixed-use development, including residential, commercial, and perhaps a hotel. And at the southern end of phase one, the development team is working with North Minneapolis food nonprofits to explore the potential for a food hub healthy food hub that would support and enhance the focus in North Minneapolis on healthy food for the community. Slide nine. To lay the groundwork and make phase one feasible will require a significant public investment and we hope that's where you come in. We need to construct the basic public infrastructure to support the new development including streets to provide access to the site. Those are shown in red on slide nine plus utilities and stormwater improvements to enhance the Mississippi River water quality. Phase one park improvements, which are green, that makes sense, include riverbank improvements, trails, and construction of the plaza and open space. And then the phase 1A investments also make phase 1B, which is shown in orange and blue, possible. As we said, we're seeking $15 million in state bond funding to be matched with $15 million from local partners. And I should point out, we know the funding is for projects that will stay in public ownership even as most of the 48 acre site will wind up as private development. So the improvements that we're asking you to help support will remain as publicly owned. Many of you have toured the site and we appreciate your attention and your attention today. And you know the challenges that we face. You've seen what it looks like. But I should say, Minneapolis and the Park Board know how to do this work. If you have been anywhere near the Lock and Dam project, walked on the Stone Arch Bridge, seen the great work around the Guthrie and the Mill District neighborhood, you have seen the evidence that we know how to take public investment, park investment, and attract private investment and people and turn what was an industrial use along the river into a neighborhood where people want to be. That is the play here. So this team, this city, this park board are ready to go to work and we ask for your support. 
Um, as I mentioned, the development team is here and we are here and we would welcome your questions. Thank, thank you so much, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you, Mr. Frank. Uh, Representative Detmer. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and, and thank you, uh, Representative Lee, for bringing this forward. And to the testifiers, you mentioned it was the industrial park. Uh, is there any uh, MPCA issues here with the cleanup? I think that's questions for me, Mr. Chair. Mr. That's right. Uh, so in, uh, if anyone's picturing an industrial park, let me uh, change what that looks like. So let me respond to your question, Representative, in just a moment. Um, there have been a series of industrial uses here. This was not a uh, master planned site in the sense of what you might be picturing when you think about an industrial park. Um, I will, I'm looking in the direction of one of my colleagues, Ann Calvert. I think that uh, we, are, we have our arms largely around the environmental condition of the site and it is surprisingly okay. My, did I say that right? I, that's the technical term. It's surprisingly okay. If you have more specific questions, the expert is right here. Representative Detmer. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And I know uh, many times uh, the MPCA can have some surprisingly uh, issues for us to deal with. I'm just wondering if, uh, if any of those issues might be with this site. That's just a, good, uh, just a good question we need to look at. Mr. Chair, if we may. Mr. Frank. Mr. Chair, members of the committee, we have done testing uh, on Identify the yourself, please. Oh, Ann Calvert with the City of Minneapolis. Um, and we have not found any significant environmental issues so far. Now, that doesn't guarantee we won't find something, but so far it has been surprisingly clean. So we have big challenges to deal with, but that isn't one of them. Thank you. And Mr. Mr. Chair, may just a follow-up. Uh, what type of industry was, was on these sites in the past? Mr. Chair and Representative Detmer, um, it was mostly barge shipping. So there were products brought in and stored at the site or brought up on barges and stored at the site and then shipped off. But it wasn't actually processing with chemicals or anything like that. So. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Representative Ugla. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chair. Well, this, I, I, I share your enthusiasm. This is an exciting project for the city of Minneapolis. But, um, I have to ask a couple questions, uh, being a former mayor myself. Uh, t you know, we're, we're being asked here to bond uh, $15 million for site preparation and so on and so forth, to bond for a redevelopment project. And I know in my city, when we did redevelopment projects and things like that, they were normally done through TIF, tax increment finance districts and things like that, internally with the city, obviously, uh, under, the, uh, under all the guidelines for TIF. Um, so this is, to me, a little unusual uh, that, uh, that the, the bonding request is here for a redevelopment project. Could you tell me why uh, you're taking such a uh, different tack and did you consider the use of tax increment financing for this site? Uh, Mr. Chair, Representative Uglum, yes, we did Mayor. consider the, the use of, uh, of TIF and in fact, we are going to be using TIF as, as part of the the, the, the money that is ultimately raised. Um, can we, uh, I'll, I'll look to yeah. Mr. Frank to Mr. Frank. give the specific amounts. Uh, Mr. Chair, uh, Mayor Fry, thank you. Mr. Chair, um, again, the, the expert Ann Calvert uh, can, can talk about the TIF and it's worth pointing out that we have another request not in front of this committee uh, seeking to allow us to use tax increment in a more effective way, both as part of the match and to help support the development. Ms. Calvert. Yes, Mr. Mr. Chair, members of the committee again. Um, we will be using tax increment. That will be the backbone of the match for the city part of the infrastructure that would be um, bonding for. The park board will be providing its own match for the park. But the magnitude of the challenges we have here between all of the infrastructure we need to do, and then we also have an overhead transmission line that really limits what we can do on the site. And that is going to be a cost that is not appropriate for bonding, but is going to take up a lot of our tax increment. So it does somewhat limit the amount that will be left. Much better. <laughs> well, it was good exercise for me. <laughs> it will, um, so the tax increment needs to be used for the match and for the power line relocation, and, and we do have a gap we need to fill. Mr. Chair. Representative Ugla. Thank you. Um, so right now the $15 million request, uh, obviously this is a big project involving millions and millions and millions of dollars. Uh, is this going to be it for bonding requests in the future or is this just the start? Mr. Frank. Mr. Chair, Representative, uh, 
I, I, I don't want to characterize it as just the start, but it is definitely the case, as I think we mentioned on the bonding tour, that this is for phase one infrastructure and there will be additional requests which will come back before you in the future. Okay. All right. Thank you. Yeah. Any other comments or questions? If, if, if I may, Mr. Chair. Uh, uh, Mr. Mayor. Ms. Calvert, if you could give a, a, a brief rundown as to the amount of private investment that will ultimately go to this project is, you know, the, the 15 million is a, a very small percentage of the amount of economic development and growth that this area would potentially see. Ms. Calvert. Uh, Mr. Chair and M Mayor Fry. We are expecting that phase one development, which is just the first of three phases, will be 100 to 150 million. And we, um, Thor is going to be in charge of most of that. We think the second phase, or phase 1B, will include the amphitheater, and that will be some additional investment, public and philanthropic. And then phase two um, also will be probably in that same range. As noted by David, we will be looking at phase three to decide what that can support. A, a few years out in the future once we see how the market responds to phases one and two. Mm -hmm. But it, it's a significant private investment, but a significant amount of public investment that we'll need in future phases too. Thank you. Any uh, further comments or questions? Uh, seeing none, uh, Representative Lee, thank you again for the treats and uh, you may conclude. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I do want to uh, say thank you to Representative Ansamo for uh, being a co-author on the bill and uh, also for bringing in some treats today, too. He mentioned that he did not bring it for his last committee hearing, so uh, <laughs> we're double tag teaming for this one, and I just want to say thank you to... Was it uh, burritos again? <laughs> I'm not sure what you brought, Mr. Chair, but I just want to say thank you to the members for uh, uh, allowing us to, sh you know, talk about this opportunity for uh, development up on the north side in uh, Minneapolis, too, and I uh, appreciate the support. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Representative Hausman. Uh, Mr. Chair, on, on, it, going back to the uh, Representative Detmer bill for just a minute, um, the very last question was Representative Dean, who asked the question, what's the total project? And they said 3.3. So when, uh, when they left, I asked them, well, isn't there a local match? They said, yes, we, we passed it last night. So I think we've got the wrong dollar amount. It's going to be 1.65. 1.65. 1.65. So the committee okay. administrator yeah, might want Matching contributions. So what, the, what, what they're asking for is 1.65. All right, thank you, uh, Representative Detmer. I think we uh, need to make sure we have that clarification. Is there anything else? Uh, Thanks for asking. Ms. Nash, where uh, where are we going again? Three, four, six for uh, my friends over here on the left, mostly. Um, so with that, we meet again next Tuesday at three o'clock. But until then, as King said, this case is closed. <laughs>